So continuing with the greater discourse on the four establishments of mindfulness, we've actually finished the parts of the, the part on the mindfulness of the body. And the next one is uh, Vedana. Vedana means, well, it's the initial categorization of a sensory input. And there are only three possibilities, pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. Uh, we do have an English word that is yeah, somewhat reasonable translation, and that's valence. But it's not a word that's well known. Uh, in chemistry, it talks about whether something is positive or negative, which is, yeah, this is what the Vedna is pointing at. The three possibilities, pleasant, unpleasant, or neither pleasant nor unpleasant. Vedna seems to take place in the old brain. In other words, it's not under your control. When I ring a bell, it sounds nice. And yeah, you can't change the sound to be not nice. If I had a blackboard and I scraped my fingernails down it, uh, yeah, you'd find that unpleasant. For sounds... It's the ratio of the overtones that matter. If the ratio of the overtones of the sound makes small whole numbers, we find it pleasant. If the ratio of the overtones don't make small whole numbers, we find it unpleasant. All right, so it's, it's pretty hardwired. Now this is for a simple sound. Music actually has a lot more going on than just one simple sound after another. There's the anticipation of what's coming next based on what you've heard so far. And uh, so it can be far more complicated. When I went to Bali, the uh, people I was, the other travelers in the guest house said, uh, there's a gamelan concert in the next village tonight. We should go. And I was like, oh, yeah, I heard about that. We should go. So we go. And a gamelan is, well, sort of like a xylophone, you know, pieces of metal that you hit with a hammer. And so they started playing, and it was weird. Uh, it was definitely weird. It, it, yeah, it wasn't exactly pleasant even. Every hammer strike produced, yeah, a sound that ratios were small whole numbers, but they were using a different scale than the do, re, mi scale, right? And I, I wasn't familiar with that. It was weird. And it took me about three pieces before I caught on to it. And then I really liked it. And I've definitely much appreciated gamelan music ever since. So it was clear that sounds in music is more than just one pleasant sound after another. There's the whole anticipation based on what's come before and so forth. So when we say pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, a lot of the pleasant, unpleasant, neutral comes from our reaction to what we're experiencing. I'll read you what the Buddha has to say, and we can explore that some more. And how does one abide contemplating Vedana as Vedana? Here, Experiencing a pleasant Vedana, one knows that one is experiencing a pleasant Vedana. Experiencing a painful Vedana, one knows that one is experiencing a painful Vedana. Experiencing a Vedana that is neither painful nor pleasant, one knows that one is experiencing a Vedana that is neither painful nor pleasant. Experiencing a pleasant sensual Vedana, one knows that one is experiencing a pleasant sensual Vedana. Experiencing a pleasant non-sensual Vedana, one knows that one is experiencing a pleasant non-sensual Vedana. Experiencing a painful sensual Vedana, 
experiencing a painful non-sensual vedna, experiencing a sensual vedna that is neither painful nor pleasant, <laughs> experiencing a non-sensual vedna that is neither painful or pleasant, one knows what one is experiencing. Okay, when experiencing a pleasant vedna, one should know it's a pleasant vedna. And the same for, well, it's here, painful Vedna. Actually, it's Sukha Vedna and Dukkha Vedna, and neither Sukha nor Dukkha Vedna are the three categories. So pleasant, unpleasant, and neither. And the idea is just to know what you're experiencing. So why is this important? Well, the Vedna run our lives. We go around seeking the pleasant Vedna and running from the unpleasant Vedna and ignoring the neutral Vedna. It's, it's like when we arrived here, they gave us an instruction manual, you know, how to be a human. And you open up your manual and it says, seek pleasure, avoid pain, live forever. Turns out it doesn't work that way. Remember the hippies, if it feels good, do it. Yeah, turned out there were some problems with that advice. We need to pay attention to the Vedna and not get lost in the Vedna, just running after pleasure. I mean, if that was all that it took, yeah, we'd subsist on cake and candy and uh, cookies and Coca-Cola and everything, right? Because that that gives you pleasure immediately. Uh, but no, there needs to be uh, some more processing of the input other than is this pleasant or unpleasant. As I said, the Vedna happens in the old brain. It occurs within a tenth of a second. And then we process what we've experienced by identifying it giving it a name, conceptualizing it. And then we have all sorts of thoughts and emotions and ideas based on what's coming in. Now, the Vedna of sound we talked about a little bit, right? The Vedna of sight, actually your eye only sees colored shapes. You see the colored shapes and then you interpret the colored shapes as flower or bird, right? But your eye is only seeing colored shapes. The sight Vedna is the colors and the shapes, right? The pleasantness you get from seeing the bird and the flowers, that's actually Vedna from your processing of the colored shapes, identifying it as bird and flowers, and then thinking, oh, I like birds and flowers. Because your sixth sense, the mind sense, also experiences Vedana. And in fact, most of the Vedana we experience are our mental reactions to our external sensory input. I can give you an example of that. I'm going to say some phrases and you're to listen to the Vedna of my voice. Okay, is my voice sound pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral? And then you are to notice the Vedna of the picture that your mind paints. Okay, so tall trees, green grass, big bushes, president bushes, uh, some different Vedna on that second one. Yeah, well, the difference is the mind Vedna. I said the word bushes as close to identical as I could possibly do. So the sound of the word produced the same Vedna. 
But then when you interpreted it, you interpreted it differently, given the word that came before it, and that produced a different mental Vedana. I read an interesting article that said that 80% of our mental activity is triggered by our mental activity. Only 20% comes from the outside world. So when the Buddha says the end of dukkha, he doesn't mean that you won't ever have any pain if you stub your toe. What he means is you won't add to the pain, the physical pain, by your mental reaction of, all right, who did this? Who left this thing here? All right, and getting all upset. It's just, yeah, painful. And maybe you say something, but you're not adding anything, any more dukkha on top of it. So what the Buddha is promising that <laughs> with your reaction, you can get rid of 80% of the dukkha you experience. Maybe even more of it because uh, you'll be wise enough that you won't go do things <laughs> that produce five cents Vedana that are unpleasant as well. Buddha had a bad back. And sometimes he would give the introduction to a sutta, a discourse, and then he would turn to Sariputta or Moggallana or someone and say, please elaborate. I need to go lie down and rest my back. And so he would go lie down and he would listen to Sariputta's discourse. And when Sariputta finished, he'd come out and say, if I'd given the discourse, I would have said exactly the same thing. But clearly, he was still dealing with unpleasant touch Vedna, right? That, that just doesn't go away. If he were to hear somebody scraping their fingernails down a blackboard, he would experience it as unpleasant. But he probably wouldn't think I'm going to kill that guy like some of us might. What we're trying to do is change our reactions. There's a sutta called the dart. I don't have the reference at hand. But anyhow, the Buddha says, for the uninstructing, uninstructed worldling, the uninstructing worldling experiences something that produces an unpleasant Vedana. And then the uninstructing worldling gets upset and their reaction to it produces an unpleasant mental Vedana. It's as though a man were struck with a dart and then immediately struck with a second dart. But an enlightened one, if they experience an unpleasant physical Vedana, they don't get upset. They don't add to the problem with their mental reaction. It's as though a man were struck with one dart, but not being struck by the second dart. So yeah, uh, full awakening is not going to stop your bodily ach aches and pains, but it'll stop the part where you're reacting negatively to your aches and pains. You won't add a second dart. You won't add dukkha on top of dukkha. So the practice is to simply be aware of the Vedana. Now, the word Vedana often is translated as feeling. And that's unfortunate because feeling in English often refers to emotions. And there are uh, some teachers who want to describe Vedana as having something to do with emotions. Uh, this is not what the Buddha was talking about. It's just your initial categorization as pleasant, unpleasant, or neither. So one experiences a pleasant Vedana and knows it. One experiences an unpleasant Vedana and knows it. One experiences a Vedana that's neither pleasant or unpleasant and knows it. All sensory input is going to generate Vedana. If you can't identify it as pleasant or unpleasant, well, then it falls into the third category, right? So, yeah, I, this, this makes sense to have this as part of our mental processing. 
when there's a sensory input, we need to process it. And in general, we want to process the things that produce pleasant Vedna in a way that, yeah, enhances the vet pleasant Vedna. This is probably something that will taste good. So it's going to be nutritious for us. Or if it's really nasty tasting, it might be poisonous to us, right? So yeah, you can see where this would be important. We could say that plants experience Vedana. They bend towards the light. Now, I doubt they're thinking, oh, this, this feels good. I'm going to go that way. It's just that the cells grow faster in the dark than they do in the light. But they're responding positively to a stimulus. Same for amoebas. If you have some amoebas, and you look at them with your microscope, and then you introduce a bit of salt, they'll run away from it. If you introduce a bit of food, they'll run towards it. And you can see this in your pets, right? The cats and dogs, they like various sensory inputs and others they don't like, right? So really what it means to be alive is to respond to your environment. Rocks, I don't think rocks do Vedana because they don't ex respond to their environment. They respond to gravity, right? But I don't see a rock thinking, hey, you know, I don't get enough sunshine here. I think I'll crawl out and get where it's less shady. Uh, so to be alive is to experience Vedana. Now, we had the first part just to simply know what Vedana you're experiencing. And then we had experiencing a pleasant sensual Vedana, one knows that one has experienced a pleasant sensual Vedana, or experiencing a pleasant non-sensual Vedana, one knows one is experiencing a pleasant non-sensual Vedana. So first is the three categories, and then each of the three categories is subdivided into, translated here as sensual and non-sensual. The actual Pali word is with flesh and without flesh. And there are two schools of thought on this. One school is what we've talked about. With flesh is the five sense Vedna, and without flesh is the mind Vedna, right? So distinguish between the Vedna you're getting through your five senses and the Vedna of your reaction. The two might even be different. You hear the sound of an airplane go over. That's actually a bit unpleasant, but maybe it reminds you that, yeah, when COVID's over, you're going to go to Hawaii and it's going to be great in Hawaii. So you have that experience as a pleasant experience, even though it was triggered by an unpleasant Vedna. Or you're just about to get into the first jhana and they ring the bell saying the meditation period's over. The bell sounds nice, but you're upset because, yeah, your meditation period's over and yeah, yeah, you didn't get to the jhana, you got interrupted. And so you have an unpleasant reaction to it. So it's important to pay attention to the external five sense Vedna and the internal mind Vedna of your reaction to the sensory input. There's a difference there. Another way to interpret uh, sensual versus non-sensual or with flesh and without flesh is uh, worldly and spiritual. So worldly pleasant Vedna, yeah, that's something to delicious to eat, a nice sound, something like that. A worldly spiritual Vedna can arise from doing metta, from being generous, from entering the first three jhanas, right? So there's sources of Vedna available in the mundane world and also spiritual Vedna that are pleasant in both cases. Unpleasant worldly Vedna, yeah, that's a stub your toe or a loud sound or whatever. Unpleasant spiritual Vedna could arise from your sitting posture. It's a bit unpleasant, but you don't want to move because you know that's going to disturb your concentration. It could arrive 
arise from getting a deep insight into anicca, dukkha, anatta, deep enough that you find it disturbing. From anicca, yeah, everything is changing. There's no real source of security. That might produce a rather unpleasant vedna in your mind. Okay. Dukkha, yeah. Ain't nothing going to be ultimately satisfying. Getting a deep realization of that, yeah, might produce unpleasant vedna. But it's useful to get those insights, even though they produce unpleasant vedna. And then a neutral worldly vedna, that's the sensations in your foot right now, which of course you weren't even noticing until I happened to mention it. it they were just so neutral, you were just ignoring it. A neutral spiritual vedna, equanimity. Equanimity as a Brahma Vihara practice, equanimity as found in the fourth jhana, etc. So I think both of these interpretations are useful. What exactly the Buddha meant, we don't know, because he just said with flesh and without flesh. But looking at them in terms of spiritual and mundane, and looking at them in terms of five sense Vedna versus the downstream Vedna is also a very useful thing. And it's important to realize that when the Buddha promises the end of Dukkha, He's promising the end of your reacting in a way that produces Dukkha Vedana. So I'm going to do a guided meditation on Vedana, but I want to stop here and see if there are any questions or comments. I'm not sure if this adds anything, but when you gave the instruction to listen to your voice and listen to the the tone i i thought okay i'm going to close my eyes the first word or series of words cut out a little bit for me but then you came back on and i wrote down neutral yeah. and then you said big bushes and i wrote down neutral cuz that's how it was so i think that there's always more, I, I'm just a little, um, I think our experiences are conditioned by all sorts of things. Not everybody is going to hear a bell and hear it as pleasant um, if they've had some sort of um, stimulus re response pattern in the past, which has been negative in association with the bell. But I just wanted to report to you that I found both utterances neutral. Yeah, the way I said it, it was neutral. The person who finds the bell unpleasant heard the bell and it produced pleasant sound Vedana, but the association in the past was unpleasant and they didn't notice the pleasant sound Vedna and they immediately got lost in the downstream unpleasant association. And that's what they experienced. That's what they were aware of. But the sound itself generated a pleasant. And it's only the downstream that's producing the negative. Because your ear, the way that your ear is set up, it's wired directly into the uh, brainstem there. And it's going to interpret the sound that has the uh, ratio of overtones as small whole numbers. It's going to interpret that sound as pleasant in a tenth of a second. But you're going to go on into your follow-up of it and that's going to happen very quickly as well. And that's going to produce an unpleasant reaction that is not, that is going to completely override the recognition of the initial sound of Vedana. And all you will actually be aware of is your unpleasant mental Vedana. That's just how we're, we're wired. To my understanding of Aidna, it's so fast that we 
almost always override it or the neutral, you know, like John Travis will say, if you pay enough attention to what you think is neutral, it, it'll move off that center mark a little bit. It's just that it's not that interesting. So we find it boring or just, it, it just doesn't need to be noticed. Yeah, I, I, I always think, and, and I remember when I was first learning about Vedana, there were a couple of teachers who said, you really can't teach Vedana because it happens so fast that it's very hard to notice because the mental association that follows is usually so strong that, I, that we bypass it. So, yeah. anyway. And it is possible to teach Vedana and it's possible to experience Vedana prior to the mental thing, if you're concentrated enough, right? So Ayakima didn't start trying to teach me about Vedana until I was skilled at all eight jhanas. And then she would say, come out of the eighth jhana and listen and notice every sound, whether you're categorizing it pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, prior to even interpreting what the sound is. You have to sit there at the ear door and when a sound comes along, just catch the Vedna of the sound prior to interpreting what the sound is and your thoughts about your interpretation of what it is. And I could only do it really at first post jhana. I didn't have the concentration necessary to do it if I just sit down and try and do it. But having worked with it and having actually seen, oh, yeah, 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 right, I get it, I get it. Then I could do it, even if I hadn't been meditating. It was, it was possible to not catch it in exactly the same way as it went by but to remember the whole sequence clearly enough to pick out the Vedna of the sound as distinct from the Vedna of my reaction and notice that the identification of the sound was happening after the sound, obviously, and after the Vedna of the sound, but before my reaction set in. But it could only do it more or less in et retrospect after I had practiced it sitting there uh, post jhana and listening and actually having the mind that was quiet enough and quick enough to pick up the Vedana by itself. I think this is an, such an important aspect of the Buddha's teaching that it's worth me putting out there. It's a really good practice to do after you're well concentrated. Now I'm doing it I was doing it after the eighth jhana because that was what I know. It's possible to begin to pick up the Vedana even after access concentration. So if you're really concentrated, it's possible to pick it up. But it, it takes some work. We have the teaching uh, to Bahia. Uh, in the seeing, there is only the seeing. So would catching the Vedana with just the seeing be what the Buddha was pointing to in the teaching to Bahia? I don't think so. I think the Buddha was pointing to, can you experience the world prior to conceptualizing what you're seeing? So it's really a practice about sanya, which is usually translated as perception, but I think it's a much better translation to say conceptualizing. So in seeing, can you let there just be seeing rather than seeing objects? Because the seeing of objects is the conceptualizing. Can you just see the visual field? And, and Vedana doesn't really enter into it, I don't think, in, in the teaching to Bahia. You're kind of answering my question, but I need more clarity. So there's, so my dog just barked loudly and it echoes. So the first Vedna is just the loud sound, but the second kind of 
source of Vedna is the reaction to the dog, the conceptualizing what that sound actually was. So you're actually getting two rounds of Vedna? Yes. Yeah, there's the ear Vedna and the mental processing of the sound Vedna, the <laughs> mind Vedna, okay. right? It's, it's actually sound Vedna and then mental Vedna and then maybe another mental Vedna and more mental Vedna. So there's sound, unpleasant because it's loud, right? And then there's identification, dog barking. And then there's the wonder what he's upset about. <laughs> oh, I wonder if the mail has arrived. I'm, I'm expecting something. Pleasant Vedna. No, it's too early for the mail. I wonder if that's somebody trying to break in. Unpleasant Vedna. So you're getting all sorts of Vedna from your mental processing, right? And you never really notice particularly the Vedna of the sound because, yeah, that's over with. And it's all your mental processing that's catching your attention now. But, our, but like with visual input, you know, the brain is just totally conceptualizing everything. Like we go for a walk, you know, the tree, it's like rapid. Yeah. Right. How, to parse that out. The, okay. To, before work you... <laughs> with, to work with visual Vedna, you need to go to a modern art museum. You look at the painting and you don't know what you're looking at. It's just colored shapes and you like those colors together. You like those shapes because you can't conceptualize what it is until you read the little sticker and see. Okay. So looking at abstract things is more likely. I don't have an abstract thing to hold up here. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So this, right. Uh, it, you know, it, it, uh, the Vedna is the colors, the shapes. What do you think? Well, if I held it up right, maybe you'd think something different, right? Because then your mind immediately conceptualizes, oh, it's the forest. But when I hold it up like this, and I'm kind of moving it around so you don't get a good view of it, then you can sort of get the visual Vedna of just the colored shapes. But we get so quickly into the downstream processing that that's all we're really noticing. I'll take it as given. I mean, it makes a lot of sense to me, the idea that certain impulses are just hardwired into our brain as either pleasant or unpleasant. Mm -hmm. But um, is there any evidence or reason to think that for some people, positive Vedana of the five senses or negative Vedana are just hardwired more strongly for certain people that it can vary from person to person? Or is that just an overlay that happens at the mental level of the mental Vedana? So everybody's kind of the same, roughly speaking, in terms of the five senses, in terms of the intensity of that Vedana. It's only at that second stage that it kind of differentiates. I don't really know how much change differentiation there is from person to person. Okay. Some people are more sensitive to sounds. Now, is that due to their processing of the sounds or is it due to just the sound itself? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, this would be an interesting thing if you want to go get a PhD and research it to, to try and find out. If I had to guess, I would guess that the processing downstream is where the difference really lies, rather than just in the actual five sense Vedna. But I'm just guessing here. And it's possible for Vedna to change. Think about all those horrible vegetables you had to eat as a kid, right? That actually taste pretty good now. So the vegetables didn't change but your taste buds changed. Now, why did your taste buds change? Uh, I don't know, maybe you ate a lot of spicy food and you burned out some of the parts that didn't like nasty vegetables. I had an example of fairly dramatic taste change happen to me. Uh, the year after, the summer after my senior year in high school, I was working at an agricultural experiment station in Mississippi in the weed control department, it was cotton experimenting. 
And what they did was they planted rows of cotton and then they put various weed control products on them. And then to see how well the weed control worked to control the weeds, they hired high school kids like me to go out there with a hoe. And of course there was the straw boss and he'd say, go and start his stopwatch and we'd chop out all the weeds and how long it took us to chop the weeds out would tell us, yeah, how many weeds there were there. And so they could tell. And then of course they would harvest the cotton. I mean, maybe there were no weeds, but maybe there was no cotton either. So it is a fairly good way to, to test things. But I'm out in the Mississippi sun. It's 95 degrees and 80, 85% humidity. It's not exactly the most fun job. But sometimes somebody had to go back to the headquarters, take a message from the straw boss back to headquarters and get the reply, of course. And if you got picked, this was really good. I mean, you had to walk, you know, half a mile, mile over the fields to get back to headquarters, but headquarters was air conditioned and there was a Coke machine in the basement, right? So I got picked and I head back and I go into to headquarters and go upstairs to the weed control department, give them the message and they give me the reply. And I head downstairs to the Coke machine and I get down there and they don't have any Coke. They only have Dr. Pepper. Well, where I came from, Coke was king. I mean, you wanted to ask somebody if they wanted a soda, you say, you want a Coke? What kind of Coke you want? You want a 7-Up? You want a Coke? You want a Pepsi? Right? Coke was the generic term. And we had Dr. Pepper and, well, Dr. Pepper was weird. It looked like Coke, but it did not taste like Coke. You know, I already had my dime out. I'd been tasting something cold and sweet for the last 20 minutes. You know, okay, I'll have a Dr. Pepper. And now I tested the Dr. Pepper for being a Dr. Pepper, not because it wasn't Coke. And it tasted so good. In fact, it tasted a lot better than Coke. I've appreciated Dr. Pepper more than Coke ever since. It immediately went from weird because it wasn't Coke to me actually tasting the taste of Dr. Pepper, which was fine. It was preferable to Coke. So some of the weird taste things may be associated with whatever the situation was, or maybe you're, I think our taste buds do change as we age. And so the strong taste that we get as a child from the vegetables sort of wears out as we get older and you know the the negative aspect of it disappears and the vegetables taste okay or maybe it's something dramatic like my dr pepper episode can you help clarify you, the vein that happens and then it, is that but does does perception come in is that when you perceive what it the, is that the perception happens right after the Vedana. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so it's contact and contact is the coming together of three things, the object, the organ, and sense consciousness, contact, followed within a tenth of a second by a Vedana, and then followed by identifying, conceptualizing what it is. And that's usually called perception, Sanya. One of the things I really like is when I go hiking in the woods and I see something and I can't tell what it is. And I can look at it and watch my mind churn as it tries to figure out what am I looking at? And then finally it goes, oh, it's mushrooms growing on a stump. And now I can't unsee mushrooms growing on a stump. The Sonia has hit. But in that two, three, five, ten 10 seconds, Perception hasn't happened, but the Vedna happened. It was probably neutral. It was just colored shapes over there, brown and other brown, okay? And I didn't notice the Vedna, but I did notice that I'm having trouble identifying what it is I'm seeing. So the perception definitely happens later. It's way more than a tenth of a second in this particular uh, 
mushrooms on a stump case. Um, that's the sense Vedana. So then does perception happen before the mind Vedana? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. So the perception is then followed by processing what I've perceived. All right. And I think, oh, I wonder if those mushrooms are edible. I wish my friend was with me who knows about mushrooms. I could ask her. Uh, she could tell me all about these sort of mushrooms. That's all coming after I've identified it as mushrooms. Right. So first it's the first division is, all right, let's divide it into pleasant, unpleasant, neutral or attractive, repulsive, neither. Okay. Now we, we've got that sorted. Now let's identify it with, by conceptualizing it. And so we don't have to try and figure out, is it something negative because we've already got the positive aspect. Right? So we don't have to look through all the drawers in the database just the, the positive labeled ones, all right? And then we find it, what it's called, mushrooms or whatever, and then we start thinking about it. And that's all, that's sankaras. And that's all of our thoughts and emotions that arise based on it. So contact, vedna, perception, thoughts, emotions, reaction, et cetera. Okay, so I'm a little bit confused because um, I thought that I don't remember ever hearing about mind Vedna, or maybe I missed it. So I thought the Vedna was purely at the sense doors, and I, I realize mind is a sense door. But if you if you smell something, and it's say unpleasant, then I thought the next step was I would call it perception, where you would identify it as liking or not liking, which is where you want to unhook between the the initial. Um, Vedna, before you start saying liking and not liking, that's where you can right. have some so the, freedom. The Vedna, you smell it and it smells pleasant or it smells neutral or it smells pleasant. unpleasant. Right. Okay. And then you identify what it is. You conceptualize the smell. It's uh, apple pie or it's cow poop or whatever, right? And then you start thinking about it. I really like apple pie. Or in my case, oh, it's coffee. I don't actually like coffee. I like the smell of coffee, but I don't like coffee itself. It tastes nasty to me. So the thoughts are actually generating a Vedna as well. That's what I was trying to demonstrate when I talked about the big bushes. There's the sound Vedna of the word right. bushy. But and then president yeah. bushes, it's the same sound. You've got mm -hmm. the same neutral Vedna, but now you're processing it differently. Right. But it seems like there's too many steps then. I was thinking that if you if you just go from the pure sense Vedna and then you, you don't go to liking, not liking, you don't go to, you know, aversion for instance with a smell um, that's where the freedom lies but if yes. you if you go then into the mind it seems like um, there's more even though it all happens really fast and it seems like it's harder to unhook yeah yeah you want to unhook it as quickly as possible which is probably going to be at the step of sanya perception, conceptualizing, naming, identifying, and not go into the reaction. So you smell it. It's unpleasant. You identify it. Oh, it's cows. And then that's it, right? You don't start thinking about, oh, the poor cows, or I want a hamburger or anything else. You just leave it right there. And that's, that's the tricky bit to guard your reactions. This is what is meant by guarding the senses. When one sees a sight with the eye, one does not grasp at the signs or secondary characteristics. It doesn't say you don't see the signs or secondary characteristics. So you see it and you can identify the sight you're seeing, but you don't grasp at it. You don't get lost in your reaction to it, basically. My understanding was that that 
you know, it's not a, a matter of making ourselves not experience a secondary Vedana that that Vedana, whether it's from the original external sense input or from some other mental process is is out of our control, but that we can control our reaction to that positive or negative. So so I I sense um a smell um and it's say a neutral smell or well maybe this is a bad example um uh maybe i could do another example where where i i see um like the postcard you held up um which was just colors and shapes and it, and i had a neutral Vedana to it and then you turned it over and it was trees and a beautiful forest oh that's my my mental Vedana which is very positive because I I love beautiful forests and and yet at that point I thought the key was okay so I've had this positive mental Vedana but I can still, if I'm mindful of all this stuff happening, I can see, oh, that's positive mental Vedana. Just like you said, initially um, notice it, but don't get lost in it and and don't start craving the idea or more, more beautiful forest or whatever. Just take it as it is and just move on. Yeah, that's hopefully what I was saying. So if I oh. said something that led you in a different direction, I'm sorry for the confusion. Okay. Yeah, so there's contact. There's the Vedna of the five sense, smelling, seeing, whatever it is. There's you identifying what it is. That's Sanya. And then there's your mental processing. But your mental processing is also going to generate Vedna. Can you keep your mental processing away from craving and clinging? It may produce pleasant Vedana. It's not a problem if your mental processing produces pleasant Vedana. It may even produce unpleasant Vedana. But if you can keep it away from craving and clinging, then you're keeping it away from going into Dukkha. Yeah, so I, I think uh, from what Deborah was saying, it's it's yeah you can you can recycle through back to the um essentially contact with a mental object and then a new vedna a whole bunch of times but still the place to break the chain or one of the places to break the chain is is after that vedna even after that perception or before the perception, and and uh, and just in other words, not to even if you go back through the first few steps several times, you just try to be mindful and and avoid letting it proliferate into craving. Right. Exactly. I mean, there's this the external sense Vedna, and if this article was right, then we're going to have five times as much mental processing or four times as much mental processing of what came in, each of which is going to produce a Vedna. Hopefully the mental processing doesn't run off into craving and clinging, but whatever it is, it's going to produce Vedna as well. And it could be that the craving produces pleasant Vedna, right? I'm going to get this. It's going to be so great when I get this. I mean, you know, the craving could set you up with pleasant Vedna or the letting go. Oh, that's, 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 that pie is really nice, but I know that the person who fixed it is fixing it for the party tomorrow and I can't have any. I hope they have a fun time at the party. There's the disappointment of not having the pie, but because no craving set in, yeah, not a problem. So there, there's prob when there's a sensory input, it's probably multiple 
Vedna going on. There could be multiple Vedna of the external sense if it goes on for a bit. And there could be a lot of different uh, response Vedna, mental Vedna. Or they could be just a one simple input from the outside and lots of response Vedna. Or you could be really concentrated and you hear a sound and it's neutral and nothing more happens. You just didn't even bother to identify what the sound was. So I was thinking about guarding the sense doors, that concept, because when I first heard the concept, it was at a retreat where somebody was just not looking up much. And even when she would ask a question, she'd barely look up and then look down. And at the end of the retreat, I asked her what she was doing. And she said, I was guarding the sense doors. And that's that, that kind of interpretation that sometimes people have. Mm -hmm. um, so I was telling you that when I went for my walk yesterday and was practicing the uh, five elements, um, there were some signs in yards, um, some of which were pleasant and some of which were unpleasant. And at the, at the eye contact, neither one was more pleasant than the other. And I was aware of that, mm -hmm. but, but I had a, a, a very immediate perception, perception of what the sign was about. And in the ones that were unpleasant, the you know, what it was about was unpleasant. I absolutely could not control the runaway train that started blah, blah, blah about, mm -hmm. you know, that. And I said to you, I think I might need to find a different pa path in my neighborhood where maybe there aren't these so many of these signs <laughs> which are still up. And um, so I was thinking about that as that's a, like that first way of guarding the sense doors. So as not to put myself in a place where there's Vedana, which is still very, I'm very um, reactive to. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, I, I just thought that was a different, uh, you know, way to work with, with the Vedana. Um, and then also, I mean, I practiced enough that I, while the train of runaway conversation with the people who had those signs was like unstoppable, there was also a way in which I was able to notice, oh, you know, identification, <laughs> unpleasant, uh, you know, I mean, I was able to observe even while I was not able to stop the train. Oh, the train is running. It's going that way. And then let me keep feeling my steps and then it would fade away. Right. And then, you know, it switch. So it's also about then how we create the world, which is just a whole, you know, probably the next subject when you're going to talk about mind, but it's, sometimes wise to yeah not go there right you, you, you know that this is just not a, a good place to get sensory input from it, it's just going to cause problems if i attempt to deal with these sensory input so you find another path and for other things particularly the ones that are attractive it, the idea is can you look at it and not get caught in it Right. So I used to teach in Santa Fe or outside of Santa Fe. And on Sunday, when the retreat ended, I didn't have I had a late afternoon, early evening flight back to the Bay Area. And so there was time to go into town, get something to eat, walk around the square in Santa Fe. And of course, on Sundays, all the Native Americans come in with their handicrafts. And it's a museum. And of course, all around the square, all these art galleries. And it was just this fantastic free museum. And I could look at everything and really appreciate the beauty of it. And I had no desire to obtain any of it. There wasn't any craving that set in. And because there was no sense of, oh, I should buy this, I should get this thing or anything. I could treat it just like a museum and totally enjoy it. So I didn't need to find another path. It's just that my reaction wasn't one that was producing craving and clinging. So it depends on the situation as to how much of what's there can come in. But hopefully on a retreat, you can actually look at the teacher without falling into craving and clinging or anything that needs to be guarded such that you never look up. Ayakema tells the story of going to talk to a Burmese monk who wouldn't look at her. 
you know, he's guarding his senses and he's, he's carrying on a conversation like this. And it, she said, it just really was awkward, you know, to have a conversation with someone who's not looking at you. And that's not what's meant by guarding the senses. If you're having a conversation with someone, can you be fully present with the person and just not lapse into anything that's problematic at all? That's what guarding the senses is. I'm trying to process uh, what you were saying and the whole discussion and kind of with the level of my concentration, awareness, I almost feel like it's kind of a, theor a theoretical concept that I'm processing on the way how Vedan is working from perspective of, you know, neuroscience and um, what other people were sharing as far as, uh, you know, like really breaking it down, how it works. And what is coming up for me um, is that so it that is not the most important to really understand what is the most important to be able to so this is kind of almost like a tool to deal with cravings and reactions so you don't get stabbed second time so when you talking to somebody unpleasant on scene even if your reaction you can actually receive it as reaction and let go right is it, is that kind of? Yeah. What you laid out is the practical aspect of it. Yeah. Don't get lost in your Vedana. Don't go just running after what's pleasant and running away from what's unpleasant. Pay attention to your reactions. And notice that when we get pleasant external sensory input, we have a tendency to want to run towards it. Yeah, sometimes that's a wise thing and sometimes it's not. And the same with the negative reactions. Sometimes running away is a very good idea and sometimes it's not. And all that we can really control is our reaction to it. The Vedana is coming in. It's happening in the old brain that's outside of our control, but we definitely can control the reaction. And that's the, the key point right there. Don't stab yourself the second time. So that would be interesting to meditate on it, <laughs> like to explore. Well, that, yeah, that's a great idea. Why don't we take uh, 15 minutes, let's say 20 minutes to try and get some concentration going, okay? If you need to take a bathroom break, just go do that and come right back and get some concentration going. And then I will make some sounds. And your job is to notice the Vedana of the sound, the Vedana of the sound itself. And you'll, your mind will go try and identify how he's, how's that guy making that sound or what's that? That's okay. Just let it do that. But try and pick up the Vedana of the sound itself. And uh, the first one I'll do is I'll ring the bell but that doesn't mean it's over. That just means it's the first sound. Okay.
does mean it's over. So, any comments? Could you distinguish the sound, Vedna, from the processing, Vedna? I noted that for uh, some of the really loud sounds, like one of the uh, bell ringing and then the whistling, it uh, was very loud in my ears and it just was, it felt more physical than mental as opposed to the other ones, which were more processing. But Yeah. Yeah, a, a really loud sound definitely has such a strong physical feeling to it. Yeah, definitely. I think for like 80 or 90% of the sounds, my conceptual mind sort of knew immediately what it was. And so there was, it was quite difficult to kind of segment out the different things that were happening, but there were maybe one or two sounds where I was, I could see my, you described it about the tree and the mushrooms. It was like, I don't really know what that sound is. And I could see my mind slightly grasping. So there was like a split second for like, just what is the, what is the sensory experience uh, which I think in those cases was kind of neutral, but mm-hmm. I could, it was just like the grasping very quickly. And then a half second later, the grasping kind of filled, filled in the picture. Right. Yeah. Very good. We get the sensory input and it goes so fast usually that we're, we're downstream quite a ways before we notice anything really. And there is that point in there where the, there is the external Vedna, and then the conceptualizing, and then the reaction, and all the Vedna from the reaction. One of the the ones, I think where you were um, swallowing, that that immediately seemed uh, unpleasant, uh, Vedna, but then I was kind of thinking about it, and it's like, well, that that actually has similar sounds to some shorebirds, um, <laughs> and and if if it ha- if I was out in a marsh or something, and and I had heard a similar sound there, I wouldn't have thought that it had any negative connotation. So, so that made me realize that what I was seeing wasn't the initial Vedna; it was the after perception and understanding that it was a person doing an impolite <laughs> noise that that I was responding to. Exactly. We're so into our own reactions to what's going on. We missed the actual thing that was going on. Yeah. It's it goes so quickly. I presume most people found the bell. It's a pleasant sound. 
right? Just that's all there is. You know it's a bell, you know it's coming. I mean, if I ring it and I stop it, is the stopping pleasant or unpleasant? Well, it's not sound <laughs> when it stops, right? <laughs> Any pleasant or unpleasant when the sound stops, it's not coming through your ear, right? That's purely mental is your reaction to the fact that it stopped sound coming through your ear when it stopped is just whatever the sound in the background of your room is right so it's you're wanting the sound to continue and it interrupts and you find it slightly negative that's your mental processing of it it's not the sound itself um before before we, you started the sound part, when I was taking my little break, there was a sound in my neighborhood. And I kind of thought I knew what it was, but I wasn't sure. And I realized I was waiting to know what it was before I decided whether it was pleasant or unpleasant. You know, I mean, then I, because I realized that there, I mean, the minute we, label it now we're using our mind we're not just having that visceral reaction right and, and that was that was noticeable a couple times with the sounds you made I, I didn't really know whether it was pleasant or unpleasant and then I realized I was kind of waiting to know what it was that wasn't always true but yeah yeah it, most of the stuff we don't know right away it's probably neither Okay, it just didn't fall into a category where you could decide. And then you want to know what it is. And then after you know what it is, then you decide based on how you interpreted it. And you, you just didn't even notice the neutral Vedna. Yeah, most of the sounds I made, it's kind of neutral, you know. I mean, maybe that's slightly unpleasant. The bell hopefully was pleasant, but it goes so fast down into what is that? What do I think about this thing that I've identified it as, etc. I I experienced uh, very similar to what what Kathy was saying, where I felt like oh, I'm I somehow I missed the Vedna. Um, you know, but then I realized, I guess it was probably neutral and, and it might be a small point, but I, I've had teachers before mention that, like you did, that, that the Buddha didn't say neutral. He said neither pleasant or, nor um, unpleasant. And I think that's an important thing. It's, <laughs> there wasn't a Vedana there with with those things that I would say in retrospect are neutral, I didn't have a, a pleasant or an unpleasant Vedana. And so I was just kind of waiting for the my own response to it to be kind of the first uh the first returns on <laughs> on what what uh whether it was good or bad. Right. Yeah, I don't know if neuroscience can identify neutral or neither pleasant or unpleasant Vedna. Uh, it, it's definitely identified uh, pleasant and unpleasant, but I haven't heard you know anybody say anything about that. So I don't know whether it's just not happening or there is something happening and it is neither. Well, it always seems like when I label something neutral i'm doing it after the fact yeah like so yeah right i have a kind of a question based on some previous experience of mine which is that so most of my sitting experience has been in the zen tradition and there the sitting tends to be very strict like once you sit you take your posture you don't move if your knees start to ache you just sit. And I had a lot of pain and the teachers would say, don't worry, it'll self-liberate. 
And I would sit for a week, no self-liberation. And then I came back again to do another week and no self-liberation. And I, it became extremely frustrating. And I have done it for years, but eventually actually something like they described self-liberation of this pain happened. And now when I get a, some tension, some pain in my knees, if I'm in a relatively concentrated place, it actually takes on, it seems to me that it takes on a neutral, sometimes weirdly even a positive quality. But I take it from what you're, from what you presented that in this paradigm, we would understand it, that that's actually just a change in my mental Vedna. I haven't done anything to change my hardwired response to that. And if I continue to practice this attention to Vedna, I would be able to see more clearly the, the underlying physical quality. Because right now, just in my own experience, it almost seems like it's taken on a positive quality, but I suppose that's just a mental phenomenon. That, that would be my guess that it's mental. The, so when I was very first introduced to Vedna, the, the teacher said, look at the unpleasant, you know, the pains of your sitting and just see them as unpleasant Vedna rather than pain, right? Get back to the raw experience and you'll find that it's not a solid thing. There's some vibratory quality to it. And so I begin investigating that. And in so doing, the aversion to what was going on dropped away. And there were, I was left with just, oh, yeah, this is all this sort of tingly stuff that's kind of unpleasant, but it's not so bad. It's the, the reaction that makes it much worse. Uh, back before COVID, I would get a massage every week, and my massage therapist is really good, meaning she really gets in there. And there's there's times I want to scream uncle, you know, it's it's deep. But what I found was that the best thing was to put my full attention on the painful pressure and just go delving into the exact nuances of it. Whereas if I just sort of left it in the background, then my mind would try and squirm away from it, which of course didn't do any good because then I'm wiggling on the table and she's not getting the knot out or anything. So yeah, a lot of the negativity to physical pain is our reaction to the physical pain. And as long as it's not, as long as it's not causing damage, then it's possible to look at it and see, oh, this is just these multitude of minor discomfort things that just aren't going away. And if I'd stop having an averse reaction to it, try, stop trying to squirm away from it, then it's much more bearable. <laughs>